Our next session is titled, A Keynote, Fintech or TechFin, A Global Perspective. It focuses on the future success of banking industry, which will be based on the ability to collect and analyze data sets, learn from the insights to improve personalization and expand offerings in response to the consumer needs. Today, the banking industry is experiencing disruption at an increasing pace. Over the past few years, traditional financial institutions and non-traditional fintech firms have begun to understand the collaboration may be the best path to long-term growth. At the same time, big tech firms are offering financial services, creating tech fin solutions. The rationale for collaboration is the ability to bring strengths of both banks and the fintech firms together to create a stronger entity than either unit could have bring on their own. To begin this, I would like to introduce the moderator for this session, Mr. Srinivas Kunte. Mr. Srinivas is a director of continuing education and advocacy at CFA Institute. He writes in leaders leading media publications and represents the CFA Institute at conferences and forums. Srinivas has an avid interest in promoting technologies used in, the, in all fields, including finance, and serves as an external research scholar at the IIT Bombay. Prior to joining CFA Institute, Srinivas worked as a country trading strategist for Citi in Tokyo, Japan. Welcome, Srinivas. Thank you. Is on? Th thank you very much, Mohit. And uh, a warm welcome and a good morning again to all of you. It's a great honor and privilege to be here today for moderating uh, a session, a keynote session. Our speaker for today, the keynote speaker for today is Chris Skinner. Chris is arguably one of the most knowledgeable personalities in the world today on FinTech. He's been named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the 40 most influential people on fintech in the world. Please give him a big round of applause. Chris, do you want to? Chris runs a blog site called thefinancer.com. Uh, he blogs almost daily. And uh, the, I've read some of the blogs and these blogs are very interesting and well-researched. There's one on Paytm too, do take a look, thefinancer.com. He has authored about 14 books. I know that three of them are bestsellers. Chris just told me that a book called Digital Bank is also in Hindi. So check your Amazon, I've not checked. I think it's not yet in Hindi, but uh, maybe Chris can mention, tell that to Amazon. Uh, in his day job, Chris uh, chairs the European Networking Forum and the Financial Services Club. He's been an advisor to the White House, to the World Bank, to the World Economic Forum, and he sits on advisory boards of several fintech companies. Prior to these current roles, he was the Vice President of Marketing and Strategy at Unisys Global. Chris has a degree in Management Sciences and a Diploma in Industrial Studies from the University of Loughborough in the UK. Chris is a Fellow of the British Computer Society, a Fellow of the Institute of Management Services, an Associate of the Chartered Insurance Institute and is also a Chartered Insurance Practitioner. Probably the word CFA is missing, Chris. You may wish to become a member at a later stage, perhaps. Chris is going to talk on FinTech and TechFin. Finance, finance and technology are really two different animals. Technology is fast and agile, whereas finance is slow, cautious, and a bit old school. So how do entrepreneurs bring these two different areas and create amazing services for the end customer. Chris is going to give a global overview. Look for three specific things, there'll be more, but look for three specific things in his uh, talk. Number one, how has FinTech evolved 
globally. Number two, he's going to cover a number of specific case studies. I think he's got JP Morgan Bank, BBVA, ING Bank, China Merchant Bank, as well as DBS Bank. Number three, look for the spectrum of services that are available in fintech today. Which of these services will actually take root in India? And try to find out, you know, where the uh, where the ball is going to be. We've got about one hour for the session, 45 to 50 minutes of presentation time by Chris, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of interactive Q&A. As Mohit mentioned, use the slide.do to put in your questions, try to be environmental friendly, don't use the question cards. And lastly, let's give again a big round of applause to Chris Skinner. Sorry, I missed to mention Chris is, uh, his Twitter handle is Chris underscore Skinner. So for those who want to tweet, please tag him in and also follow him in, on Twitter. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Srinivas and uh, Abhishek and Nick. And good morning to the town of Boiled Beans, as I discovered in my taxi ride yesterday. Nice to be here. I haven't been to Bangalore before. I've been to India before, to Chennai and Kerala. Um, so. I love coming to this country. Um, hopefully I've got some slides coming up. I'm going to use some slides just to talk through what's going on in the world. And um, I could talk for a long, long time because I blog every single day. And I have been writing about a thousand words a day about finance and technology for over 12 years um, because I'm very sad. Um, and I started mainly because someone invited me to do that. And it's led to writing um, so much. There's a number of books that I produced, 15 in total, of which only three are worth reading. Um, digital Bank, Value Web, Digital Human, which are the last three. Um, doing Digital, which is the one here I'm going to reference, which is a project I'm working on at the moment, which Srenev has already has referred to, which is that I got fed up with people saying banks are rubbish and they don't get digital. They are being disrupted, they're gonna be destroyed. Uh, they have no idea about innovation because that's not true. Banks are not stupid and they are trying very hard to innovate. It's just difficult because when you run an organization that's been created over the last 200 or more years and have to completely transform that business from the ground up into a totally different business, it's very hard, and I'll talk about how to do that. Um, I do a lot of other things as well. So I'm involved in a company called 11, 11FS, which has just been voted the number one UK new consulting company. Um, they deliver digital banking um, and have a number of podcasts like FinTech Insider. So if you're not already subscribing to FinTech Insider, please do. Um, and I also run a group called Nordic Finance Innovation as well as the Financial Services Club, which Shonev has referenced. But rather than talking about what I do, I'd rather talk about the way in which the world is changing. So this morning I'm going to talk through four things. And I'm going to start with this quote from Bill Gates, we need banking but we don't need banks. Rubbish. I'm not saying Bill Gates is an idiot, he's a great guy. He, is a visionary. But this quote that a lot of people use is absolutely not true. We may not need banks to do payments. You know, we can make payments with other companies. We may not need banks to get loans. We can get credit from peer-to-peer -peer lenders. We may not need banks to do savings. You know, we can save with alternative companies. And we may not need banks to invest with. But banking is what banks do. And it's completely different to payments and loans and savings and credit. Banks do do those things, but the core of banking is actually being a trusted store of value and a trusted intermediary for sharing that value with other institutions that you don't trust. And that is very different to payments, credit, loans and savings. And I don't think Bill Gates realized that. Because when you look at the history of banking, it goes back thousands of years. 
to the money changers being thrown out of the temples and creating the arguments of a usury that splits Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and other religions. When you look at the history of finance, it goes back to things that have been created over thousands of years, such as the invention of Switzerland as a country. How does Switzerland become the trusted country to store wealth? Well, it goes back to the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar used to take pilgrims to the Holy Land in the 12th century and before. And they managed the trust of people who were wealthy with promissory notes. You know, the Medicis in Italy created the banks that we know today as the ledger systems that we have today, taking deposits, recording those deposits, and being trusted to be able to return those deposits in the future. And it's really all about these regulations and rules that have been built up over centuries that creates the modern banking system. And the modern banking system is a trusted store of value as a trusted intermediary that is not something that's dismissed overnight by technology. That's naive, really naive. And a lot of fintech companies when to talk about disruption, disintermediation, they don't understand this. They think it's irrelevant. But when you think about countries, economies, global trade, it doesn't work without the backing of regulations, rules that have been built up over centuries, because that creates the trust for cross-border trade. When I look at things like cryptocurrencies, I get very frustrated because they say it's money without government. But if you don't have government over money, you have anarchy, you have stupidity, you have Mt. Gox, you have people who can create exchanges without actually having any understanding of how money is stored. And people have no comeback because there's no regulations in the wild west of cryptocurrencies. But it will come, it will happen. So in my view, only banks can do banking, but they have to change and do it digitally. And this is where we have the biggest challenge today. How do we do banking digitally? Because the banking business model was implemented in the industrial era. And in the industrial era, the banking business model was about the physical distribution of paper in a localized network of buildings and humans. But now we deal with the physical distribution of data, or digital distribution of data rather, in a globalized network of software and servers. It's a completely different business model. A digital bank is nothing like an industrial bank. We have to move from analog to digital. What is that new business model of banking? When we look at that new business model of banking, we can see the stark contrast between the industrial and the digital. Because the fintech startups are creating amazing new capabilities by connecting things. In fact, the whole thing about digital is connecting things that people need with the people who have what you need. The whole business model of Google, Alphabet, is based on, you want, to, you want to know something, find the answers, connect you through a platform between the questions you have and the answers we can find. The whole business model of Facebook is a platform of you have friends and they have content and we can connect you to that content. Uber, the whole business model of Uber and Lyft and Grab is you need to go somewhere, here's someone who's got a car. All of these businesses are based around the premise of connection and platform. They don't make anything, they don't produce anything, they just connect everything. And this is what the fintech community is doing, they're connecting everything. So my favorite fintech startup is Stripe. And the reason they're my favorite is that they're one of the highest valued and fastest growing, and they're global, and they're a platform. And what they provide is seven lines of code in an API to check out online really easily. 
They're used by Apple Pay, Kickstarter, Uber, Airbnb, all the hot internet companies and startups use Stripe for merchant checkout. It's stitched into their fabric. It's something you don't even see. It's a business to business service. It's not a consumer service. <coughs> but in October 2018, Stripe was valued at $9.2 billion with 400 employees. And JP Morgan Chase was valued at $245 billion with 235,000 employees. So in other words, in just five years, Stripe was producing 22 times more value per person than the industrial era bank of JP Morgan Chase, the highest valued, most prestigious bank in the world, they claim. What intrigues me, and I think this puts it in context completely starkly in black and white, is when Stripe got their next valuation in their next funding round. So they got another funding round in October 2018. And they're now valued at over $20 billion with 1,000 employees, therefore producing $2 million, $20 million of value per employee. But look at JP Morgan Chase. They're now at 167,000 employees. Two years before, they had 235,000. And their valuation is you know, $385 billion compared to $245 billion two years before. So the valuation has gone up 50%. Their employees have gone down 30%. What's happening? The digital banking model is being implemented by JP Morgan Chase and by Barclays and by other banks. And what's actually happening is that we're automating everything that can be automated. We're getting rid of stupid jobs. What's a stupid job? A stupid job is being an abacus, a calculator, doing stuff that machines can do. Everything machines can learn will be learnt. So we have to teach people to do things that machines cannot learn. That's our challenge. And when I look at the business model of a bank or any business, they have the same structure, which is three businesses in one. So they have a back office that innovates products and services and does the administration. They have a middle office that's the infrastructure and the processing and connecting the front and back office. And they have a front office that is all about the customer and the customer relationship. And we've had this discussion around this business model for a long, long time. And if over the break you want to talk to me about it, there's hundreds of books that talk about the business model of any company, a retailer, a processor, a manufacturer. And historically, it's been all about trying to do that across lots of lines of business. So some big banks believed in universal banking, that they could do all these capabilities of front, middle, back office across all these lines of business, across every country. And it's failed. Universal banking doesn't work. Because there's now a thousand, in fact, there's a hundred thousand, in fact, there's millions of companies that are just trying to do one of these things really well with code in a digital revolution. In a physical world, banks could control front, middle, back office distribution, processing, and manufacturing. In a digital world, you can just do a little piece of that. Investment, banking, processing, settlements retail banking, user experience apps. So it used to be product, process, and people. But today, it's actually more about product, platform, and experience. In the digital world, our devices are connecting everything for us. We don't expect to have a face-to-face -face human experience. We expect device-to-device -device experiences that support us in our lives. And the processing between the front and back office has to be real time, immediate, between m billions of devices rather than millions of humans. It's a massive difference. When you think of Airbnb, it's connecting people who are trying to find a place to stay with people who have a spare room through a platform. And that's their model, connecting people who need to sleep with people who have rooms. Very simple. That's why they're the biggest hotel chain in the world with 
no buildings. They just connect people who need to sleep with people who have beds. The first time I heard a fintech company ever talking was on the 30th of March 2005. And I remember it well because we thought the guy was an idiot. He presented at a meeting I hosted in London. And his presentation was about the idea of connecting people who needed to buy something with people who had money through a platform, through an algorithm, through software and servers. We thought he was stupid. And this idea was to be like an eBay for money. So you put money in, and the money's distributed through the algorithm to thousands of borrowers. But now that business is one of the largest personal credit lending institutions in Britain, a peer-to-peer -peer lender called Zopa. And we all know Zopa and what they do now. It's not actually regulated and allowed in all countries, but it's encouraged in Britain. And so there's a massive peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace in Britain that's highly regulated and endorsed by government. And Zopa's become one of the biggest personal credit lenders in the UK. Last year, they had about a 6% market share. And so far, they've enabled over 5 billion US dollars of lending between people who have money and people who need money. But they do not claim to be a lender because they don't lend themselves. They connect people who have money with people who need money through an algorithm with about 150 staff. And what happens in that business model is you collapse the overhead because you've got rid of the buildings and humans and replaced them with software and servers. So the basis points differential between the investors and the borrowers on a Zopa platform is about 150 basis points that gives them their profit and covers their overheads. For a bank with buildings and humans and credit risk managers, 400 basis points differential. They cannot compete with a fintech startup that does things through algorithms. And this is the big challenge of the business model of digital banking versus physical banking, industrial banking versus digital banking, that now we're dealing with apps and APIs and analytics in an open banking platform. And we're no longer dealing with buildings and humans and physical distribution in a closed bank banking platform. It's a completely different business model, radically different. When you look at the front office, for example, with the devices connecting through the Internet of Things, it's completely viral. It can explode overnight into a new competition that you never ever saw before because you didn't realize they existed, such as Venmo. Yeah, Venmo was created by Ikram and Andy, these two guys, on a weekend when Ikram forgot his wallet. It turned up they were best friends at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They spent the weekend together in 2010. Ikram forgot his wallet. And so Andy was writing down for the weekend everything that he was subsidizing it ground for. So you just had a cappuccino, $2.50. You just had a panini, $5. Oh, a martini, that's $10. And at the end of the weekend, gave it a scrappy piece of note saying, you owe me $186.23. And it left the building and said, I'll send you a check in the post. And then went, this is ridiculous. We're millennials. We're developers, we code, let's write something. We both use PayPal. Why don't we do something about making it easy to pay when you, someone forgets their wallet so it's cashless, so I can send you money over the weekend. And they created Venmo that weekend in 2010. And they sold it to Braintree in 2012 for $26 million. And Braintree was bought by PayPal in 2013 for almost a billion dollars. And PayPal has turbocharged Venmo to become the number one social mobile payments app in the USA, generating over $40 billion of processing last year, which is actually smaller than what the banks do. Banks have produced a thing called Zelle. But the banks did that years after Venmo were launched. And the difference is, if you go to the USA, people just say, oh, I just Venmoed you. And if I Venmoed you, you get a message saying, oh, Chris just Venmoed you $15. Download Venmo if you want to have the money. What are you going to do? You get to download Venmo. I want the money. Thank you. I just Paytm'd you. Download Paytm. I just Paytm'd you. I want the money. You know, if you want the money, the virality of that is incredible. 
because it means that immediately you have an explosion of something new that occurs almost overnight because of the network and the network effect. But the network effect doesn't work if you don't have really good infrastructure to process the app's capabilities, which is where the middle office gets amazingly interesting through this network of APIs, application program interfaces, plug and play code, open systems, open banking. To me, it's illustrated best by the example of PayPal. PayPal launched their API in 2011, well before everyone else got the idea. And that was for their online payments. They launched another one in 2013 for their mobile payments. And the reason I use this chart seven years later is that you can see an interesting feature of APIs, which is why this makes absolute sense. Because if you become the code of choice, people take your code and plug it into their code. That's how Stripe works. That's how Braintree and Venmo and PayPal works. So in other words, other people do the work they put your code into their code, like an Uber checkout or an Apple Pay, but you get the transactions, and therefore you get the small percentage fees of the revenue. So you get more revenue because there's more transactions on your code, but other people do all the work. Why wouldn't you do that? That's the whole point of open banking. And that's the whole point of the FinTech startup community, because they're saying, I can do one thing brilliantly well in trading and processing and settlements in corporate actions, in anything in banking. I can just do that one thing brilliantly well with a few lines of code and take your piece of that process apart. So banks that think they have to do everything themselves, developing everything themselves, are dead. You have to partner and collaborate with specialists who do one thing brilliantly well and curate those to your customers. And when I talk about Stripe, and as I said, my favorite startup, the reason it's my favorite startup is not only because it's one of the highest valued fintech unicorns in the world, but because when John and Patrick Collinson came up with the idea of seven lines of code for merchant checkout online, they were teenagers. The brothers were 19 and 21 years old when they started the company in 2010. And so many fintech startups are being started by kids who can code who have vision, who can see the frustration and the friction of banking that's traditionally a very old closed loop mechanism and now see the opportunity for this open mechanism of digital access. Kids who can code are changing the future of banking. Finally, we have this space in the back office where actually the biggest battle will take place between the traditional banks over the next decade. Because traditional banks have all the data. And if they can provide the analytics of that data, then they can win. And we talked about big data and cloud a decade ago. And that's all now coming together into artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's where the biggest battle takes place. How can you get more knowledge of customers and their lifestyles than the competition? How can you leverage your intelligence of the customer? It's amazing how many banks have such a depth of data about their customers, but they put it into lots of different silo systems that are product focused, that were implemented in the last century. That actually means they're done with their data. If you're done with data, you'll never win. You've got to be intelligent with customer data. And intelligent means far more than just analyzing customer data. It's getting customer permissions for customer intelligent marketing and customer intelligent service. And right now, most banks are not doing customer intelligent anything. In fact, most of the artificial intelligence that banks are deploying is for risk and compliance and regulation and fraud. Nothing wrong with that, but you've got to be intelligent about customers because Amazon and Alibaba are really good with customer data and intelligent with customers. How intelligent are we about customers? There's lots of examples of the implementation of artificial intelligence in financial services. And my favorite is JP Morgan software, which actually analyzes customers' contracts in their commercial banking relationships. So their corporate customers have contracts. Traditionally, lawyers have to check the contract's wording. 
Now they have an artificial intelligence engine that can check the wording of the contracts in one second that traditionally took 360,000 hours of human reading by lawyers. How ridiculous is that? Let's get rid of the dumb stuff that people do and let the people do intelligent stuff and at the same time sack all the lawyers. That's a great idea. U UBS. Sorry, I don't know why this is not working. There you go. Um, UBS have a robot for their um, wealth management clients that can analyze instructions from clients and implement them in a second. Historically, it would take their wealth managers 45 minutes. JP Morgan can do best execution instantaneously. And if you look at JP Morgan with technology, they've gone from a company that 10 years ago was nowhere in investment banking to being consistently in the top three and often number one because of technology. It's their technology deployment that does that. Goldman Sachs lament the fact that their traders have all disappeared. They used to have lots of traders. There's none anymore. And in fact, this is really well illustrated in New Jersey by the UBS trading desk, which historically looked like this. This is the, J this is the UBS trading um, investment banking services in New Jersey, USA in 2005 and today. Every job we can automate with software, we will. Why wouldn't we? And you may say, so what does that mean for the people? Well, the people do other jobs. You know, Revolut, which is one of the big fintech unicorns in Europe, was founded by a trader from Lehman Brothers who lost his job on September 14th, 2008. You may remember that's when there's a little bit of a crisis. People will start new companies, new fintech companies new companies that deploy new technologies. They'll become trainers, explainers, and sustainers. They'll train the technology, the machines, to do jobs. They'll then explain what those machines are doing to the management and to the customer. And then they'll maintain, sustain those machines to make sure they keep performing well. As it's International Women's Day, a great example of machines that get it wrong is Amazon. Amazon had an artificial intelligence engine that was there to analyze recruitment applications. And it rejected all the applications from women. It did that because it learned that historically, Amazon would only hire men. And historically, that's because 90% of the applications to Amazon were from men. And so it ignored all applications from women. Obviously, they've now corrected that and maintained, sustained the machine to recognize equality. But machines only learn what we tell them to learn. They're only as good as what we tell them. And no presentation is complete without mentioning blockchain. So uh, there you go. I've mentioned it. I'm not going to talk about blockchain. I've only got 40 minutes. And it's, that will take an hour. So we'll go there later. I'm working on a new book, Doing Digital. And Doing Digital is a project that I managed to persuade JP Morgan, um, BBVA, ING, DBS, and China Merchants Bank to join in with me. And it's because I got fed up with people saying that banks don't understand digital. They do. Just that they're not doing it very well. And the reason most are not doing it very well is because they're adding digital as a channel, as a project, as a function to their old industrial business model. They're not reinventing their business model to be digital from the ground up, digital at the core. You know, the whole reinvention of banking with digital as a transformation, not as a evolution. This is a study from BDO that just came out last uh, in January. And 40% of banks in the USA think that they're implementing digital transformation. I do not believe them, but they say they are. And the reason I don't believe them is that digital starts with a scale, which is beginning with doing what we've always done, cheaper and faster with technology, business as usual. Uh, gradually, we get into testing and exploring and trying new ideas and innovating. And eventually, we get into digital being in the DNA of the institution, a cultural change not just a project, a radical transformation of the institution from the ground up, not just an investment. And there's lots of ways you can look at this transformation. Um, but I look at it as, can I see that the bank's leadership team 
have completely revolutionized the thinking of the bank and internalized that to every member of that organization. Not just invested in a project. Have they transformed the thinking of their institution? And there's not many, but JP Morgan Chase, DBS, BBVA, ING, China Merchants Bank have done that. And so I asked them, what have you done? I want to learn from you. What, you know, what have you been doing for the last 10 years? Uh, or, or in some cases more. I mean, BBVA started this 15 years ago. And I'd summarize it as four phases, which is working out what to do, then working out how to do it in your own business, then do it, and then do it better. You know, exploring, planning, changing, improving. Four phases. This is actually standard classical business transformation stuff, so it's nothing new. Um, but having said that, there are some interesting things. You know, when you talk to them, they don't think they're a bank anymore. They don't even think they're a digital bank. They think they're a fintech bank. They think they have technology integrated completely with their business. They've got rid of all their legacy infrastructure. They've regenerated their systems of the last decade. And that's really difficult to do, but they've done it piece by piece, part by part. But it's not just their legacy systems and legacy vendors they've regenerated, but their legacy structures and their legacy management. So it's, everything has been regenerated. They think like big tech companies. So one of the things they've all done is they've gone out and they've met with the Netflix, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Googles, the Alibabas, the Tencents, the Badoos, the Pingans. They've met with all the fintechs. They've tried to understand what is it about them that makes them tick. And they've tried to internalize that so that they can act like big, big tech themselves. You know, one of the things that Amazon's famous for is their customer obsession and their principles of leadership and their two pizza teams. And you may not be familiar with two pizza teams, but when you look at microservices architecture and you give the commitment for people to make change in the business, then you have to allow them to make decisions and make things happen. And you can only do that in small teams. And small teams are two pizza teams. Because if they need three pizzas for lunch, the team is too big. Two pizzas should feed the whole team for lunch. So you have small teams. And technology is business. Business is technology. They don't separate this. There's no longer a IT function. It's actually developers and designers and coders sitting with auditors and treasury and compliance people and working together in microservices teams. So when I walk around these banks, these small teams of typically up to 10 people have whiteboards where they're ideating all the time and developing and coding and designing all the time together. They don't separate this stuff. And they realize that data is not oil, data is air. I mean, when you talk about data is oil, oil is a fossil fuel that's gonna be limited and declining over time and disappearing. Data's everywhere. You know, we upload 60 terabytes of data to the internet every second. And if you don't get the data, if you don't analyze the data, if you don't use the data, you fail. Because data is what we breathe. You know, that's the difference, data's breathing. It's not an oil, it's air. One of the things that surprised me, because I didn't realize it, is that the banks that are transforming have to have the board behind them. They have to have a mandate from the executive board to protect them from the shareholder. Because the shareholder is always looking at the quarterly return and the bottom line and the cost income ratio and shareholder value. And that's what most banks focus upon for that reason. But if you can get the chairman and the chief executive to work together to lead the change and protect the book you from that focus, then you can transform the bank. And they still deliver those results, the return on equity, you know, the shareholder return. But they don't do it focusing upon that. They focus upon customer. And then they create a burning platform for change. Amazon's going to eat our lunch. Silicon Valley is coming. Digital is going to destroy the bank. And then they create a compelling vision to take the bank forward. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to achieve it. This is how everyone can play a part. This is what you need to do. In fact, what's interesting is that the freeing of their people is probably one of the biggest challenges culturally because how do you get people who have been historically controlled and set them free so they can think 
so they can challenge, so they can get new skills. It's amazing how many of these banks are reskilling their people. They're all reskilling their people. They're saying you don't have to lose your job, but only if you learn to code. So here's two hours every day of Python training during your lunch break, if you want. Or here's two hours of training every day to become a social media customer service manager, if you want. But if you don't want, then leave. Because we want everyone on board. We want to bring everyone with us. We don't want to lose people unless you don't want to come with us on this journey. And not everyone does want to go on that journey, so some people do leave. They have these fast communications where everyone meets and they meet informally all the time and it's very unstructured. And often it's just standing up because if you have a sit down meeting it takes 10 times longer than a standing up meeting. So stand up and talk. And it's really decisive. You know, most of these banks, if you need to get the chief executive to make a decision, that day, you can meet the chief executive that day and get that decision. It's not months. That's stupid. These are flattened organizations where you can meet immediately with whoever you need to get things done. The focus is on getting things done. And when you have all these microservices teams eating two pieces and get decisions in real time, really fast thinking, you've got to synchronize them. So the real job of the leadership team is to synchronize the teams synchronize the organization, conduct the activity. And that's one of the things that they really do well. And they're all absolutely customer focused, customer obsessed. I met the chief financial officer of one of the banks and had an hour long discussion and halfway through I said, how come you haven't mentioned return on equity or cost income ratio or shareholder return? And she said, because that happens naturally if you focus on the customer. Focus on the customer, you deliver everything that's needed to the business. Start with customer focus. And she, as a chief financial officer, was obsessed about customers, as was the head of human resources, the head of treasury, the head of audit, the head of compliance. No one was talking about their function. They were talking about a customer obsession to engage them digitally in a great experience. And the only thing that is different, really, about all of these institutions and everything else is that we are regulated so we can have time to change we don't have to change immediately overnight but the regulatory part is not going to protect us forever technology companies will get regulated I realize I'm moving out of time so I'm just going to do the last part very quickly and then go to questions with friend of us but if you look at the bank of the future the bank of the future I think has four roles it is, it is an asset management company, but historically it's been physical assets, and I think in the future it's digital assets. You know, why do we trust Facebook with our memories when Facebook abuses our privacy all the time? What we really should have is a f digital vault that protects us and supports us, not some guy who just sells our data and abuses us. I'll wait till you take the picture. <laughs> We need a secure data storage system, which is what banks provide because they're regulated and licensed. And data is money. Data is value. Data is not just memories. Data could be intellectual capital. It could be our contracts. It could be anything that's of value to you. Why are you storing it on a memory stick? Why are you storing it in Facebook or Google or whatever you use, Dropbox? Banks can play a role in that area. Banks can also be great life event managers. You know, when we think about open banking and open APIs, we should be thinking about the events that customers deal with and bringing all those APIs to manage those life events. Our first relationship, our first child, our first home, our first death, our first job loss. You know, we think, should think about this differently. A great example for me was from one of the banks who were talking about a car accident and said, the app should manage the accident for you. So it orders a tow truck, it orders the taxi, it maybe contacts the hospital for an ambulance if needed. It, it informs the insurance company. It assesses the damage. The app through open APIs can do all of that for you. Why should you have to do that? Why should the customer have to think about money? We need to think different about money. In particular, when I think about thinking different about money, and part of the presentation theme that I was meant to talk about is tech fin rather than fin tech. 
When I meet companies like Ant Financial, which is the third of my book, Digital Human, because they think different, the example of how they think different is real-time loans. So we think about annual insurances and annual loans and annual contracts because in an industrial era model, the physical overhead of doing something more frequently than annual is too difficult. But the tech fin companies put the tech first. Yeah, so FinTech does what we've always done in banking, faster and cheaper with technology. The tech fin doesn't know anything about what we did in banking. It just knows about technology. So Ant Financial can provide loans for the next five minutes of up to $5,000, if that's what you want. There's a reason they do that, is that they're an escrow service when they started, and so their merchants on Taybal often want to have the money now and rather than waiting 14 days for the customer to pay which is how escrow services work. But why not do real-time products, real-time loans? Trov from Australia does real-time insurance. I'm going out of the house for the next five hours. I've got an iPhone and an Apple Mac. Insure me for the next five hours for those goods. Okay, it's 25 cents for the next five hours. So the bank of the future, I think, is a real-time provider of finance and financial analy analytics about my digital life. It's a life events manager. It's a safe data vault that can be shared with security with people I don't trust because the bank does that for me. And it's a curator of the thousands of fintech companies that do one thing brilliantly well and deliver those to me with the due diligence that a bank has provided around those fintech partners rather than me having to go out and do the due diligence myself. So I could talk for hours because I write millions of words and an average thousand a day in tech and banking and financial technology in the future. But I know you wanted to ask me some questions, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. It was an inspiring and uh, Thank you. a very broad talk. You've got very limited time and there are a number of questions. I'm counting the questions. Let's start very quickly with blockchain. Uh, what are your thoughts? Will blockchain take root in India and in what form? Well, I mean, India to me is a fantastic example of innovation um, with the uh, India stack and UPI and Aadhaar and the things that have been developed here, government endorsed and supported, which some people don't like because they view it as intrusive and government monitoring. But when you have over a billion people in a digital identity scheme, that's fantastic. The flaw in the digital identity scheme Aadhaar is that it is on a central database and therefore that database is targeted consistently and hacked consistently and people are undermined consistently because a digital identity scheme should not be on one system that's central. It should be on a decentralized system. And I think India chain and decentralizing digital identity into the blockchain is going to be a fascinating development. In fact, digital identity is the main application of di distributed ledger technology. And we could get into a debate around what's the difference between distributed ledger technology and blockchain, but as I say, that would take a long time. But if you think of it as basically that we're decentralizing structures, then um, there's, in fact, there's two things. One is decentralizing structures so they cannot be hacked, um, such as with identity schemes. The other is that because we've decentralized those structures and everyone has a copy of the database, then we can have the network manage the database rather than humans managing the database. And we can share the database with people we don't trust because no one can crack the database because it's decentralized, it's not centralized. Uh, so I think of blockchain distributed ledger technology as the ability to share a database with lots of people who I don't trust through the internet and the network manages the database and keeps it trustworthy. Uh, and that's why the technology itself is transformational. But when you look at where it can be applied, it's actually, if it's really in its best use cases, it's in really complex areas like digital identity. And digital identity is really complex because you can't just do that within um, ICICI Bank or Yes Bank or HDFC or whatever, um, State Bank of India. You've got to have everyone agreeing this is the scheme. Um, and that's not just the banks and the government, but all the corporations and the citizens and everyone in the country saying, this is the scheme. Um, and so 
that's the real issue with blockchain and distributed ledger, that most of its use cases are in areas that involve a lot of people agreeing that it's the right thing to do, but the time it takes to get them to agree it's the right thing to do is years, not months, and the technology itself is actually very simple, but the problems it addresses are really complex. So, uh, very, has it worked in any other country? Has blockchain really taken root in any other country? Yes or no? Well, it, I think India ha is internalizing technologies faster than a lot of other countries. Um, so, one of the things I say in a lot of my presentations is that um, India, China, Central and South America, Africa, uh, are all doing things much more visionary than Europe and America. Because Europe and America deal with legacy. Yeah, most of what Europe and America have as infrastructure was implemented before Mark Zuckerberg was conceived. So to try and change that is really difficult. But when you have something like Adhar started in 2007, when you have things like Alipay started in 2003, um, when you realize that you have infrastructure that just didn't exist 15 years ago, then you can leapfrog the rest of the world, and I think India is. Right. So I'm going to club three questions into one. Uh, you talked about innovators' dilemma. Startups uh, face, fintech startups face problems. How should they be looking at things? And you talked about supplanting things instead of disruption. Can you throw light on these three concepts? Probably they are interlinked. Yeah, I mean, I don't agree with disintermediation because it's a word I've heard for three decades, showing my age, and it hasn't happened. Um, and I don't agree with disruption either, really, in that uh, I think what we're seeing is banks have this luxury of um, being a utility that customers aren't that bothered about changing. Um, and sure, you can create a sexier, newer beast that's more attractive, but to get a customer to actually switch to that beast, it's really difficult. Um, and, and so I kind of see three big tectonic plates coming together in the future of finance. What you have is the FinTech startup community um, and the TechFin startup community, bearing in mind there's two. Um, but they're doing things um, with no history, no customers, no trust, and often no regulation. And as they grow up, they have to eventually come together with banks. And banks have centuries of history, millions of customers, and billions of capital, and a lot of trust because of their regulatory structures. Um, so that's why collaboration is now the name of the game rather than um, the battle between the startup community and the banking community. And then you have the big tech giants, which is the third plate, who I don't think will ever get into banking because. Um, a lot of them, that would be biting the hand that feeds them. You know, Amazon Web Services, who's their biggest user? Banks, Facebook advertising, who's their biggest investor? Banks, um, Alibaba, who's their biggest supporters? Banks. So you don't want to do that, but the big tech giants, I think, will act, you know, eradicate a lot of the margin for traditional banking products like credit and payments. Um, and so what banks have to do is to adapt to survive. And that's the key message, which is, you know, banks have been around for hundreds of years. Barclays Bank is the oldest bank in Britain. They've seen civil wars, they've seen world wars, they've seen uh, massive change in society, they've seen people landing on the moon, and they've survived all of these changes all those years. Uh, why would they suddenly disappear? You know, th they're not, as long as they adapt. And that's the key message, you've got to adapt and work out how to collaborate with fintechs, how to deal with the big tech giants and the threat they, uh, and the opportunity that they provide. So there are two separate markets you are seeing, those who are not being serviced and those customers who are already being serviced. Is that right? So there are two separate markets, the bank servicing one market, fintechs uh, servicing the other market. Well, I, I'm not, it's not as black and white as that in terms of as split as that. You know, what, one of the favorite themes that I have is when I talk about tech fin, that they start with no preconceived notions of what was there before because they just think about the technology. And so, you know, Paytm in India is one of my favorite stories because I met Vijay Shakasharma, who's the founder. 
Uh, and if you know his story, he's often eloquent about the fact that a decade ago he was homeless because he got bankrupted by his ex-friends and he was sofa surfing and choosing between a meal uh, and walking to a job interview or taking the bus and having the job interview and not eating because it was as dark as that and yet now he's one of India's youngest multi-billionaires um, and that, the reason I recount the story is that Digital financial inclusion and digital networks offer massive opportunity for everybody and anybody. Now, he is the exception to the rule, but I think anybody from Africa, from South America, from Philippines, from India, if they see the digital opportunity and the vision and can code, could become a millionaire or billionaire in the next few years because that's what the viral network effect means. That's what the Venmo example means. It's all about if you've got a great idea and you deploy it and it gets picked up and used, then you can find yourself with huge success almost overnight um, because that's what the network opportunity provides. Where do you see uh, the prol proliferation of FinTech and its greatest impact? Uh, in India, front office, back office, or middle office, or any other emerging market? I think, well, fintech can impact front, middle, or back office. Uh, a lot of what we see is, and what a lot of commentators talk about is the fintech front office retail experience, because most of us consumers and most of us can see the impact that's having in the front office, like the Revoluts and the Monzos, which I talk about often, or the Simples and the Squares. Um, but what I would say is that FinTech actually is impacting every part of the value chain, front, middle, and back office. And what we need to wake up to is, if we're a large bank, um, some strategic decisions. The hardest thing for a bank is to say, we're not good at these things, because they think they're good at everything. But if you can work out, what are you really good at? You know, where's the real strength of my bank? then fill in all the rest with fintechs and startups and partnerships and collaboration. Stop trying to do everything yourselves. I saw a presentation from HSBC a few years ago, and they were delighted to talk about the fact they have 30,000 developers, which is more than Microsoft. Why? You know, it's ridiculous. Get rid of them. Start collaborating. Will there be more jobs in India as a result of uh, uh, fintech uh, taking roots in many other countries? Well, India's... Uh, you know, got so many great att attributes in terms of the fact that uh, we have the ability to talk in my language, um, even though my book's in Hindi, you know, I, I speak in English. Um, but we saw the massive offshore growth in India and call center growth in India. That's going to go away. You know, that's not sustainable. Um, there's not going to be a need for call centers in the long term future because chatbots and artificial intelligence will take over. So you have to rethink the skills. And that's really what I was saying about we have to teach children things machines cannot learn. Uh, if machines can learn everything about facts, stats, and dates, then kids need to learn emotions, creativity, and art. So teach kids to learn things machines cannot learn. And if India invests in that new educational program, I think India will be very successful. How do you see the role of institutional banking changing uh, given FinTech? Well, it, Institutional banking, if you take the fact that most retail bank customers are more likely to divorce their partner than leave their bank, um, for an institutional customer, it's more likely that they would go bankrupt than leave their bank. And the reason being is that institutions have a huge commitment to what they see as a utility. As long as you store my money, transact efficiently, and give me access to my money in real time, I'm happy. Um, so what institutions will need in the future is those hygiene factors to store money and transact money and give me access, uh, augmented with a lot more data enrichment, lot, a lot more knowledge. You know, my issue right now is that my bank, uh, and I'm a small corporate, um, you know, just tell me that I got a payment and don't tell me who the payment came from. They don't give me the data. I want far more data. Right. Uh, very quick answer, tell, tail risk. Will digital banking increase the tail risk? Will it increase riskiness in the, uh, in the banking place? No, it, re it reduces risk. The biggest risk right now is um, cybersecurity and being hacked. But if you have everything monitored and managed in real time digitally and have an enterprise consistent view across the whole organization of that digital dashboard, you're going to be far more uh, in tune and lower risk than the companies that don't have that.
quick closing advice for CFA Society India, CFA Institute. You mentioned learners and explainers in your role of the future. Quick advice, we've short, run out of time. Uh, I think basically no one's going to have the same job for long. Uh, there's a book called A Hundred Year Life because the average human born today will live for a century. Uh, and if you have a hundred year life, you're going to go through lots of job changes. So always be curious, always learn things, always give yourself new skills. And if you just sit still, then you're going to get run over. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, that's all the time for today. I hope you all have enjoyed this. Thanks, Thanks for